what I want to do for this video is to cover Averroes, Maimonides, and Aquinas. And what we'll notice in the outline and is that uh, there's a running theme of natural theology. Okay, so, um, and that's what I want to emphasize here. And, and this natural theology then is kind of the culmination of scholasticism uh, in Europe in the person of uh, Thomas Aquinas. Um, uh, well, one in particular come up in later discussions and and I'll use uh, St. Anselm. Anselm of Canterbury is going to be one sort of earlier version of scholasticism, which is more uh, Neoplatonic, which I've discussed in just these most recent uh, videos. Uh, Aquinas is like almost purely Aristotelian um, and does somewhat a little bit more sophisticated work, uh, but it's all bound up in this natural theology which takes it more over into the realm of theology rather than philosophy. And, um, and so uh, let me talk about Averroes first. So Averroes is still part of the Arabic philosophy tradition. He's like the standard bearer for Arabic philosophy at the end of the uh, 12th century. So as you know, in the late decades of the 12th century, the 1100s, and this is when cathedrals are starting to be built all over Europe and everything. So Europe is kind of having a, a, a big a flourishing economically and uh, politically. And um, there's a kind of uh, population growth and people are moving into cities. And Averroes is part of the Arabic speaking world, but he's in Al Andalus in modern day Spain. And so he's like this bridge between Arabic philosophy and scholasticism. And after Averroes, um, the influence of Aristotle becomes much more heavy. And that's just, you know, less than a century later, just a, like a, a generation or two later, we have uh, Thomas Aquinas, and he uh, really solidifies what scholasticism means at this time period. And then he's like, almost like the great, last great scholastic. I mean, as far as great, he is the last great scholastic because he really overshadows all the other scholastics. Uh, but then scholasticism is declining already by the time that Thomas Aquinas comes on the scene. So he's kind of a callback to this earlier time period, but at the same time is very innovative. Um, and so, you know, he's a, he's a very interesting sort of figure that's on the cusp of this transition um, from high medieval feudalism into late medieval uh, feudalism and the decline of feudalism and the Renaissance, uh, you know, and, and Thomas Aquinas sits right on that cusp, uh, but he is trying to hold on to the old ways. Okay, so Averroes is in uh, Cordoba in El Andalus, um, and it still is a uh, part of the Caliphate. Um, it's an emirate, uh, emirate um, holding and uh, has all those features. He's writing in Arabic, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, Latin, more European um, scholars visiting Cordoba, and there's starting to be more exchange uh, between Europe and especially Cordoba. Is this is this uh, for intellectual matters? is this bridge between the Islamic learning community and the learning community of Europe. 
And Averroes is this, uh, now Averroes by the scholastics, so, you know, by these later scholastics in the model of Thomas Aquinas, is known as the commentator. Okay, so Aristotle in this, you know, sort of shorthand, Aristotle is the philosopher and Averroes is the commentator. And, and a lot of his writing is just going through Aristotle, um, you know, page by page and interpreting it in a way that makes it very appealing to the medieval mindset and, and making it not only appealing to Arabic speakers, but also the Latin scholars from, from Europe. Uh, so that's interesting. But a lot of his argumentation is against other Arabic uh, philosophers and theologians. Uh, so this is a portion of uh, the Wikipedia page on Averroes himself. And it says, in his philosophical writings, Averroes attempted to return to Aristotelianism, which according to him had been, had been distorted by the Neoplatonist tendencies of Muslim philosophers such as Al-Farabi and Avicenna. Okay, he rejected Al-Farabi's attempt to merge the ideas of Plato and Aristotle, pointing out the difference between the two, such as Aristotle's rejection of Plato's theory of ideas. Okay, he also criticized Al-Farabi's work on logic for misrepresenting uh, its Aristotelian source. Okay, that's not something we've really talked about. Um, he wrote an extensive critique of Avicenna, uh, who was the standard bearer of Islamic Neoplatonism in the Middle Ages. He argued that Avicenna's theory of emanation had many fallacies and was not founded in the works of Aristotle. Uh, Averroes disagreed with Avicenna's view that existence is merely an accidental uh, accident added to essence, arguing the reverse something exists per se and essence can only be found by subsequent abstraction. He also rejected Avicenna's mod, uh, modality and uh, all right so uh, I didn't t I didn't cover Avicenna's modality um, although it is kind of relevant to our discussion but I'll have to fix that next time. Uh, Avicenna's argument uh, and, and he also argued against Avicenna's argument to prove the existence of, of God as the necessary existence which we did talk about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay so now Avicenna was very influential on Latin philosophy as well. And so that's maybe what we see in uh, St. Anselm, Anselm of Canterbury, is uh, the influence of Avicenna um, and, and precursors to him, Al-Farabi. Al um, but then, so Averroes is really changing the game and, and he's making this much more Aristotelian. And, and, uh, and by my estimation, uh, Averroes is correct. Uh, if you wanna be Aristotelian, then you can't be doing what Avicenna was doing, okay. Um, but that's not to say that Aristotelianism is correct, right? It's just a, a choice. And the earlier tradition of philosophy was to be more Neoplatonist with a nod towards Aristotle, but the Neoplatonism fits maybe much more naturally, but maybe not logically according to Averroes, um, but much more naturally with um, Islam and trying to integrate Islam with philosophy. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that is in Plato that, that makes this all, uh, that makes Plato more appealing as a philosopher when you're coming from a theological framework to some degree or another, is that Aristotle did argue, or sorry, Plato did argue for the, um, the immortality of the soul. He didn't think that he proved it, but 
he he argued that he would like to think so uh, that that the soul uh, survives the body and um, and even many things uh, in many concepts that people think of as Christian uh, come from Plato rather than from like the biblical authors uh, from the Bible so like like ho the Hollywood version of heaven is platonic it's not biblical um, so uh, angels with you know a person becoming an angel and sprouting wings that's straight out of Plato um, and um, and and not found in the Bible that, that a human being you know when they die sprouts wings and flies up to heaven that's not in the Bible but that is in Plato so that's like a you know a big example um, and many things in the Quran seem even the Quran itself seem heavily influenced by Platonism so you know there's a lot of good reasons why uh, Islamic scholars would gravitate towards uh, Neoplatonism, you know, with some Aristotle mixed in, but still retaining these very Platonic uh, sort of uh, sort of ideas. And the same thing goes with the earlier scholastics like Anselm. Uh, it makes a lot of sense why they lean towards a Neoplatonism rather than towards an Aristotelianism. Okay. But Rose makes some uh, good argument if, if you're trying to be Aristotelian, and that's the thing is people, the scholastics, even when they were Neoplatonic, like to pretend that they were Aristotelian because, uh, for example, logic, um, as it was studied at this time, was straight out of Aristotle. And that was one of the fundamental um, liberal arts. So our liberal arts education, if any of us have, have like, um, done any liberal arts training uh you know in the field of education or anything like that you'll you know get an idea of what the liberal arts is and 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 one of those um liberal arts is logic and at this time period and all the way up until the 20th century when people talked about logic they were talking about aristotle's logic so the, you know there's good reasons why people would appeal to aristotle for rhetorical reasons uh, but maybe be more inclined towards Platonic ideas uh, and, and notions, especially when it comes to metaphysics. And Averroes is like, no, if you're going to be Aristotelian, then you got to take the metaphysics in. And you know, so he's a he's a staunch Aristotelian. Okay. Um, and then he does argue for a nat no, no oh, and something I should say in that little description that I just read from Wikipedia, we can see something that's already come up in what I've said is a thing exists if it has two aspects, if it has matter and form. That's hard to jibe with uh, what the way that people normally think about God, because that would mean that God has to be if God exists, then God must have two aspects, a material aspect and a formal aspect. And that doesn't, I think that's the sticking point. Why, why these philosopher theologians gravitate in a Neoplatonic way. And, and Averroes uh, in, in many ways does suggest that. Um, if not explicitly say it, but I mean, then that's, that's very difficult. And somehow he was able to navigate it, thread the needle, but that's very difficult um, for um, an Islamic way of thinking. Because like I said, even in the Quran, it seems to be more in the Neoplatonic direction, um, where there's spiritual existence that is not material existence. And, and, and and that's sort of what was alluded to in that that description there the the platonic theory of ideas that ideas can exist and are not material okay um 
and 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 of course in Plato the the, the big idea is the uh, idea of beauty or the good and in many ways that seems to be the same as God in this Platonic way of thinking and in Neoplatonism that becomes the one okay and I've mentioned that before okay so you know there's this struggle between going and leaning to Plato or leaning to Aristotle and kind of have wanting to have it both ways Averroes is like no you got to be Aristotelian but then there's some big problems I think for for most people okay and um that are like believers in, in some kind of uh, God that is not material. Okay. Um, but, we've, but we have seen that Aristotle's notion of matter is not what most people think of as matter. So, I mean, that's kind of how you get around it. Um, and then and, and, and that, that will come up, and I should maybe just mention this here, is, um, and then that's going to come up in modernism. Uh, this is the way that, that uh, the early modern philosophers, there was one way in which uh, the early modern philosopher, Descartes, tried to thread the needle on that issue of spiritual things that are not material. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we get to that point. Okay, so... Um, so Averroes strictly Aristotelian, and then he has this notion of natural theology, that whatever we discover by philosophy, and by philosophy we mean science and philosophy, the state of the art of science at the time, and a lot of science was being done uh, by the Arabic uh, philosophers, uh, lots of advances in medicine, lots of advances in mathematics, lots of advances in uh, observation, you know, biology and, and, and physiology and documenting um, observations. Uh, it's not readily what we think of as science uh, from our modernist perspective because it, it wasn't atomism and all that kind of stuff um, and the so-called scientific method. Uh, but a lot of important um, scientific groundwork was laid during these centuries by the Arabic philosophers. Uh, so much so that, and I'll show this in a couple of videos in the future here. Um, you, you know, uh, I guess it'll take several before it really gets to the punchline, but the punchline here is that without Arabic philosophy, you know, modern science, especially in the way that uh, we're using that word modern, uh, modern science couldn't exist. I mean, it, it is entirely dependent upon um, the, the work of the Arabic philosophers. Um, okay, so who were, you know, Neoplatonic, Aristotelian, doing Aristotelian physics, and, you know, so... Um, it all flows together. Uh, okay, so natural theology, it, whatever we discover by philosophy, meaning science as it existed at the time, cannot contradict the revelation from God found in the Quran for Averroes. Okay. So whatever the Quran says is not going to contradict what philosophy says, and whatever philosophy science says is not going to contradict what the Quran says. That that's in now this is a way of kind of reintroducing theology uh, back into philosophy because philosophy has to conform uh, to the Quran. And then this is where you get into a lot of mental gymnastics about how do you make that work? How do you construe Aristotle in such a way that it makes it conform? And uh, I don't think I can give a good explanation of that. Okay, so <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Um, 
And then uh, Maimonides, who was of the same uh, generation as Averroes, uh, also became very influential for Latin European speakers. And now he was he was born in Cordoba. Uh, so he would be um, well versed in Arabic. And so Arabic would be one of his primary languages, along with Aramaic or or some kind of Hebrew, but um, I believe Aramaic um, would be sort of his natural language and and then uh, and then I believe he also wrote some things in Latin so or at least it was translated early on into Latin. So he's another one of these bridges between uh, Arabic philosophy and Latin European philosophy because he was surrounded by the Arabic philosophy, but then he was excluded in a way from that because he was a Jew. And not to say that he was super persecuted because, as I mentioned before, in the Islamic empire, there was a good degree of, of uh, tolerance for you know, infidels, for, for people who did not uh, believe uh, the correct way, but uh, they were still allowed to practice and and Maimonides was one of these rather uh, prominent Jews um, who was a, a leader amongst Jew, Jewish theologians and had a public persona and, um, and published works that were very much about Judaism and Jewish theology. And he was read by Arabic philosophers and by Latin philosophers. So <clears throat> he's this bridge. And uh, now he's very influenced uh, by Avicenna, okay? And he sees God as uh, God from the Tanakh, from the Jewish Bible. And that for Christians, the Jewish Bible is the Old Testament. And then the stuff about Jesus is the New Testament. So there's like the old, the old deal and the new deal. The old deal is the is the Jewish uh, Bible called the Tanakh in Hebrew, and and then the New Deal for Christians is like the stories about Jesus, and then subsequent uh, leaders of the church who talk about Christianity and you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and he sees God of the Tanakh, and and of course now. In Islam, God is very abstract, as I mentioned before. You don't attribute uh, anthropomorphic features to God. But in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament of the Bible, God is very anthropomorphic. Um, and so Maimonides is finding a way to integrate Avicenna, who's operating at this more abstract level. Uh, he, he finds a way to to make that work within the context of Hebrew way of the Hebrew way of thinking about God, uh, and does some does so fairly successfully, and and so um, that that is something that then Latin philosophers theologians seize on to. And uh, again, he's a natural theologian, so he's um, connected to Avicenna in a lot of ways, but also connected to Averroes through this natural theology uh, notion. And you know, I do want to say that he is more of a theologian than a philosopher. Okay, and and so what what he does is more a way of uh, it, it's called apologetics. It's like being, it's like being the defense attorney for the Tanakh, for, for the the Hebrew way of thinking about theology. And so he's using philosophy and Aristotle and even Platonic ideas to the extent that they can help his case. Okay. And um, but but Averroes committed to following Aristotle, where it might lead. And um, 
you know, so that's that's interesting. Okay, and then uh, Thomas Aquinas again is more theologian than philosopher. He's purely an apologist, and he's not only defending uh, like the Bible. He's not only acting as the defense attorney, the apologist for the Bible from a Christian perspective. Um, he's very narrowly an apologist for Roman Catholic doctrine, you know, laid down by the Pope. Whatever the Pope says, I'm going to prove to you that that's the right view. Okay. And, and it doesn't matter. Whatever the Pope says is right. And so Aquinas's job is to make the case. And so he makes the case. Um, but it's more theology than philosophy and, you know, from a philosophical perspective, a little dissatisfying because it is just like, it, it's more rhetorical uh, than philosophical because he, always, he already has predetermined um, conclusions that he's going he's gonna to come to. Um, it, it's a little boring and not, not very, I would say not very honest. Okay. But a lot of people would disagree with that. Okay. Um, and, and that could be said for a lot of these philosophers that we're talking about during this time period, that they are apologists. And, and so there is a dishonesty there. Uh, it's just with the Arabic philosophers, because the concept of God is so abstract, they kind of get away with it a little bit more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and, and Aquinas was very heavily influenced by Averroes and Maimonides. Okay, so it's like he's like, okay, I'm gonna combine these two guys together, and I'm gonna make the case for Roman Catholic um, dogma. And and he just gets to work, and he writes the big book, the Summa Theologica. Uh, that's his masterpiece, which is just like covering almost every aspect of Roman Catholic dogma um, and, and doing it in an argumentative style, uh, but not in a prospective style. You know, he's already made up his mind. He's just going to prove to you why you're wrong if you, if you disagree. Okay. Um, and Aquinas was very influential in his day. Uh, called by the scholastics, you know, Dr. Angelicus, the angelic doctor, Dr. Com Communis, um, doctor of the community, like the community of believers, um, of like the community of monks or, you know, that sort of thing. And Dr. Universalis, the universal doctor. And here doctor doesn't mean like a medical doctor, though that's, you know, there's an overlap in the etymology there, but uh, meaning like master, like master theologian, you know. Um, and, oh, and then Thomism is uh, fairly popular even to this day. So, you know, if you go to uh, Notre Dame, you know, which gets its name like Notre Dame, uh, the cathedral, but it's Notre Dame in, in the United States, uh, that university, you're going to find a lot of Thomas there teaching philosophy and theology uh, and lots of different courses as well. Um, a lot of Roman Catholic intellectuals are heavily influenced by Aquinas to this day. And, and that was sort of the, that's sort of the thing is that Aquinas provides the intellectual cover for intellectuals to remain Roman Catholic, you know? And so the people who are, who are uh, devoted to the Roman Catholic tradition and then become intellectual, you know, Aquinas is a way for them to integrate those things and, and stabilize that Roman Catholic identity. And, um, and it's pretty effective. All right. So and and uh, and so there would there'd be a lot of people, a lot of scholars in the United States to this day, in this day, right now in the 21st century, that would would um, would totally disagree with my derision of Aquinas's approach. But but I have good reasons for that. If you want to know those good reasons, 
take my philosophy 103 critical thinking class. Okay, that's all about um, philosophical methodology. Okay, um, okay, so that looks good for this for this outline, and so I'll move on to the next uh, segment of the course. Okay, bye bye.